All right, well, uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker, but I first want to thank each of you for being here, whether you were uh, coerced into being here, bribed by extra credit into being here, or completely here of your own free will. I uh, appreciate each of you coming out today. Um, this subject is extremely important, occupational licensing. It is not the matter that you hear about in the food fights on cable news 24-7, but it is important because it impacts real people. And whether or not it impacts you, it will definitely impact someone you know. It has real tangible uh, implications in people's everyday lives. Um, and to kind of illustrate that, I'm going to share with you an anecdote that the Lieutenant Governor um, likes to share when he talks about this issue. Um, last year, Lieutenant Governor Griffin was speaking to a group of prison inmates that were graduating from a, a faith-based program that they volunteered to be a part of as they're getting ready to exit incarceration. And the program equips them with life skills, helps them develop a career plan, uh, prepares them to transition back into society. And so a lot of these people are, are really excited for their second chance at life. And Lieutenant Governor's talking to one of the inmates in particular, a gentleman named Fred, and he asks Fred, he says, look, what are you going to do when you get out of prison? And Fred says, well, I used to live in Massachusetts, and when I was in Massachusetts, before I got wrapped up in crime, I was a barber. I cut hair. And I'd like to do that when I get out of here. But I still, I don't have enough clock hours to be a barber in Arkansas. I still need 500 more clock hours. And the reason is because Massachusetts only requires 1,000 clock hours of experience, whereas Arkansas requires 1,500. And so some people might say, well, you should just go get the extra 500 hours. And if you divide 500 hours by eight hour days, that's over two months worth of additional training that someone leaving prison that doesn't have a job, that doesn't have money, uh, would have to go through. It represents a significant burden. Um, plus, there's also the side fact that I don't think many people would dispute there's not a mass epidemic of horrible haircuts in Massachusetts because they, have, they require 500 less hours. Um, so that's just something to chew on. It kind of speaks to the tangible uh, aspect of this issue. So our speaker today is Steven Slavinsky. He's currently the Senior Research Fellow at the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty at Arizona State University. He's also the author of, uh, uh, or, sorry, the author of a recent article, Turning Shackles into Bootstraps, Why Occupational Licensing Reform is the Missing Piece of Criminal Justice Reform. And that takes a look at the link between occupational licensing burdens and crime recidivism <coughs> at the national level. And he's working on a separate report with Acre Scholar and UCA Assistant Professor of Economics, Dr. Thomas Snyder, investigating that same issue at the state level here in Arkansas. He is formerly a senior economist at the Goldwater Institute, senior editor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, uh, director of budget studies at the Cato Institute, senior economist at the Tax Foundation, and author of 2006 book, Buck Wild, How Republicans Broke the Bank and Became the Party of Big Government. Um, and he has been published in outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, New York Post, um, and has appeared on some TV outlets you might have heard of, CNN, Bloomberg, Fox News Channel, and MSNBC. And also, I'm led to believe this is his first trip to Arkansas. That is true. He enjoyed some good barbecue earlier. So please welcome Stephen Slavinsky. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, David. Can you all hear me back there? I can go ahead and just project and no need for a microphone. My name's Steve Slavinsky, as David said. Uh, I'm from Arizona State University. It is my first time here in Arkansas. I grew up in Florida, so not too far away. But um, when I was at the uh, Whole Hog, which is where we went for lunch, uh, they asked me what I wanted to drink and I said, tea. And then I paused and said, wait a second, can I get sweet tea? And they looked at me like, is there any other type? You're an idiot. Why, why wouldn't you order what was normal. So in any case, it was, it was really, really good to be here and I'm really enjoying it here. It does remind me of Florida in a lot of ways as well. I want to tell you a bit about the research that I've been embarking on uh, at Arizona State University. And in fact, uh, it's, it, there's a lot of com commonality with ACRE, not just in the in kind of the research that we like to do, but also in sort of how we're structured. We also have uh, faculty that we're going to recruit uh, to, to teach economics at Arizona State University and policy specific and policy relevant economics, like the type I'll talk about today. 
this presentation is sort of a summary of, of three big papers that I've worked on uh, over the past couple of years. And as you see by the subtitle, uh, it's looking at uh, the burdens of occupational licensing, specifically on low-income entrepreneurs, immigrant entrepreneurs, and those coming out of prison looking to get into the workforce. I find this an interesting combination of people because there's a lot of commonalities between these populations as we'll see. But I also think it's, it's especially important and relevant because we have seen, and there's a general consensus, and I'll talk a bit about that during the presentation, as to the most burdensome regulations hurting these populations the most. These are low-income entrepreneurs trying to work their way out of poverty by starting a business. These are immigrant entrepreneurs coming to the United States to pursue the American dream, or these are people coming out of prison looking for a second chance in life. These burdens of occupational licensing are actually hurting these people the most, and I'll explain to you how that happens in the course of this presentation. When people ask me what are occupational licenses, the easiest way to describe them is they're a permission slip to work, and not just any permission slip, it's one given by the government. It's basically a, uh, a, a question you have to ask the government, can I work in this field? Now, not all fields, most states will license doctors, lawyers, many of them license accountants. There's a lot of reasons for this, but these are higher end professions. And yet, most of the proliferation and the growth in licensing, these permission, these requirements to get permission from the government to work in a certain field, are generally more now for service occupations. Barbers, as was spoken about earlier. Some places you need a bartending license, Sometimes you need a license to be a landscape worker, childcare worker, a number of different things. And so what you discover is that the broad sweep of these regulations uh, are often justified, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, that in a minute, uh, justified on the grounds of public health and safety. And yet for some of those professions, it's not clear uh, either intuitively or through the evidence that we see that these laws actually accomplish the goals they were intended to or the proponents of those rules said they would. Now, there's a very wide range of burdens across states, which is good for me as a researcher and for economists because we can see these natural experiments. All 50 states have different burdens. But 10 states, uh, to give an example here of the variance, 10 states require four months or more of training for manicurists, but a state like Alaska only demands about three days and Iowa about nine days. So, one would have to ask the question, is there a wide variance in quality between manicures? Now, I don't happen to know this, but based on what we know about other professions, I'd venture to say there probably isn't a great deal of variation in quality, and yet we have a very large variation in the amounts of uh, work requirements, or I should say training requirements, to receive the license or the permission slip to work. And as I've said before, these, uh, these occupational burdens don't really line up with the public health or safety risk. So for instance, 66 occupations have greater average licensure burdens than emergency medical technicians. I can think of uh, really not very many professions that should uh, have some kind of training involved. Emerging medical technicians certainly are one of those. They hold your life in your hands if you want to be cliche about it. But it's hard to see how uh, that certain licensing burdens for say cosmetologists, people who are cutting your hair for instance, are going to need to exceed those of EMTs. Uh, in fact, here's exactly the example that the average cosmetologist spends about 372 days in training and the average EMT only 33 days. Again, I'm not saying that neither license or either profession shouldn't have training. I'm just simply saying there is a great deal of disparity between multiple professions. And it's not entirely clear to me uh, or anyone who's studied this issue that the licensing requirements at all line up with the health or safety concerns that they were passed to try to alleviate. So what's the consensus of scholars on these issues? Well, I'd say there's a general consensus that occupational licensing has uh, burdensome impacts. And specifically, they can suppress job opportunities for people trying to get into an industry. Maybe that's not too surprising. There's high barriers to entry, and so fewer people are going to be able to scale those barriers to entry. But of course, these barriers may be arbitrary, as I've already said, so it's not entirely clear to me that these job opportunities are being suppressed for any real public good reduces worker mobility. A lot of these licenses do not have transferability between states. So if you get a license in Arkansas, it's not very likely you're gonna be able to transfer that license to another state. Certain licenses do transfer. Education is probably one of those, uh, a teacher certification for instance. But most part, most licenses don't transfer to other states. And so as a result, if you are a worker with a license and you spend a lot of time and money to get that license, you're probably not gonna to move to another state. 
The reason this is a problem is because one of the things we've seen in the literature about how to work your way out of poverty is you're better, better off moving to a place that has the best employment prospects for you. But if you're stuck in a state because your license isn't transferable to another state, you're less likely to move to a better opportunity economically. And as a result, you're going to be reducing your worker mobility, not just between states, but also up and down the income ladder. These licenses also have a tendency to keep out competition. You might start noticing a pattern here. These are all related in some way. Because if you're in an incumbent industry and you are an incumbent firm and you realize you can then lobby the government to get higher burdens, higher barriers to entry into your field, you can begin to realize, well, that's actually going to keep out competition. And wouldn't you know it, this is exactly the kind of lobbying efforts we see on the state level to not just increase burdens and barriers to entry for existing firms and existing industries, but also to create new barriers in new industries that have yet to be licensed. But of course, because you're keeping out competition, you're also suppressing job opportunities and reducing worker mobility. So you can see how all of these are related. And I would also say, finally, most of them are related in this way as well. And that is, we've seen in the studies that there is no significant uh, benefit in, in health and safety outcomes. Again, part of the reason why these licensing laws were put into place t decades ago was because we were in a world in which it was harder to really gauge reputation. Now, I'm putting the best case forward for what I think the licensing argument would be 20 or 30 years ago. I don't think they hold up very well now. But at least you might be able to say that there was some health and safety benefit in the past in terms of signaling your ability to do a job well and safely for your customers. Well, what we've seen in 20 to 30 years of analysis is that there is actually no significant, noticeable, perceivable difference between the health and safety outcomes of states that don't license, say, dentists uh, or cosmetologists in those that do. So again, we begin to see that there's uh, the, the argument about keeping these intact for the purposes of, of benefiting people in terms of health and safety actually uh, doesn't seem to, uh, to work so well in the analysis. So I'm going to start with the, the first of three papers here and just give you a brief overview of all of them. And we'll have questions at the end, and I love the question and answer part, so I want to make sure we, we get to that so you guys can kind of chime in and tell me uh, what sorts of things you think about what you're seeing here. But the first part is, based on what we already know about how licensing works, how burdensome it can be, and how it can keep out people from different markets that might otherwise be benefited by having a job in those markets, you can begin to see how this could be a, a way of approaching uh, new approaches or, or new, uh, new remedies to, to poverty alleviation. Uh, a lot of times we talk about how we should be subsidizing uh, uh, certain programs to try and education programs to get people moving their way up the income ladder, and those could very well be important. That's an empirical question that I don't know quite the answer to, but I can say that occupational licensing is a very, very strict burden that even if you had the education requirements available, there are still fees. There are all sorts of processes you have to go through. Licensing boards in different states have varying degrees of veto power as to whether you can receive that license even after you've done a series of different sorts of, um, uh, of, of jumping through hoops and such. So one of the important parts of this is that you can look at uh, a number of data sets that are out there. And, and I should say, uh, before I go any further, that uh, the first two of these papers that I'll be talking about today uh, were funded with a wonderful, generous grant from the Kauffman Foundation. Kauffman Foundation is great because they actually have a really great data set that allows me and other scholars to dive into what low-income entrepreneurs look like, uh, what types of industries are they in, uh, what sorts of backgrounds do they have. Uh, help at male, female, age brackets, all these sorts of things. And it'll help us understand what low-income entrepreneurs look like. I'll get to that shortly. But one thing you start to notice is that because you have wide variance in licensing burdens, meaning those barriers to entry, you also have wide variance in the entrepreneurship rate of a state. So the question becomes, maybe occupational licensing burdens have some kind of ability to explain the difference in the rate of entrepreneurship between states. Now, let me just uh, quickly note that uh, the way Kauffman Foundation and a lot of scholars uh, define entrepreneurship, it's basically self-employment that is a full-time job. So most of people's incomes, if they're self-employed in this way, is, is coming from the business they start uh, or just the entrepreneur endeavor they have in all of this. Now, there are two types of, you can start seeing maybe some slight differences here. You can start seeing that there are probably more than one type of entrepreneur. Uh, and the literature tends to break them up into two different categories. The first is what they call necessity entrepreneurs. 
These are folks that maybe they're in a, a pretty dour labor market, maybe it's a recession. So as a result, in order to really put food on the table and to get money in your, in your, uh, in your wallet, you have to do something. Maybe traditional employment is not an option. Maybe there aren't very many jobs to be had. So instead, you turn to self-employment. But what you notice in the trends and in, in the time scale, or rather, sorry, the the time frame uh, and the time series here, is that those types of entrepreneurs, those necessity entrepreneurs, those who are self-employed because out of necessity they need to be, tend to drop out of the entrepreneurship definition and go back into traditional employment at some point in the future when the economy improves. That leads us to the second category of entrepreneurs, which is what you might call um, opportunity entrepreneurs. These are folks who seize an opportunity, who see uh, an opening in the marketplace to start a business and, and really be successful at it. Those are the folks that I think we're most interested in looking at when it comes to occupational licensing. Uh, additionally, one way of, of trying to figure out to minimize the amount of necessity entrepreneurs and uh, maximize the number of observations you're seeing for these opportunity entrepreneurs, you might want to look at a period of time that has the most robust economic growth. And so you have to pick a period to figure out, okay, and by the way, incidentally, Kaufman Foundation has actually found a pretty clever way in later years, uh, more recently, uh, to, to tease out who are the necessity and who are the opportunity entrepreneurs. But at the time I did the study, that was not available. So I chose a period of time right before the current Great Recession, as they call it, uh, to look at to see if we can pinpoint those opportunity entrepreneurs and whether occupational licensing had any impact on their status, or more specifically, if a state had more entrepreneurs, but also lower licensing burdens. Now, you guys are in college, so I don't think you'll be too scared by a scatter plot, but I want to explain to you what this is. There'll be three of these in the course of the, of the, of, uh, of the presentation. But what we're looking at here is along the horizontal axis, the low income entrepreneurship rate. Basically, these are folks who uh, are self-employed, in the way that I described, but they're in the bottom two quintiles of a state's income uh, spectrum. Uh, and then the top, I'm sorry, the, the, the vertical is the percentage of occupations licensed. Now, one thing that needs to be, again, clarified here as well is the measure that we use to, uh, to measure the burdens of occupational licensing. There's a group named the Institute for Justice. Uh, they, they've done a fantastic job uh, over the course of two specific studies in this case, looking at what these burdens are. And they gauge the burden across the board. They look at the type of fees that are required, uh, the, the type of schooling that's required, maybe a high school diploma is required, a uh, number of training hours that are required. What was so remarkable about looking at the difference between low income entrepreneurship between states is that the one thing in, in that rostrum of a dozen or so different measures in the Institute for Justice report, the one thing that was the most compelling and more specifically the most predictive of an entrepreneurship rate was actually just the percentage of occupations licensed. What does that mean? Well, the Institute for Justice study looks at about 100 different occupations, low income occupations. They're not talking about light, uh, doctors or lawyers. We're talking about tree trimmers. We're talking about cab drivers, uh, barbers, uh, landscape workers, things of this sort. And if you look at the percentage of those occupations that are licensed, you suddenly see a, a way to explain the patterns between the states. And so we have what they call a scatter plot, which uh, shows you all the observations. This is a low income entrepreneurship rate on this horizontal vertical percentage of occupations licensed. And in the case of, if you're a state policymaker, you want to be in the bottom right. You want to have a high entrepreneurship rate and a low percentage of occupations licensed. In case you can't really see the pattern here, here's the line. Uh, basically, uh, that's they call the regression line, that's the slope, basically, as you would expect. The lower you get in the burdens, the higher your, uh, your entrepreneurship rate uh, is likely to be. So, we see that there is some clear uh, differences here. We can look at averages now. So if you look at the percentage difference uh, from the average low, excuse me, low income entrepreneurship rate. So basically, take, just take the average of all the states that you've observed, and you want to see how much higher are states with low burdens in their entrepreneurship rate for low income workers, are low income entrepreneurs, and those with the high burden. So here is the high burden, 11%, can you really read that? Yeah, 11% below the average. And it just so happens, and this is sort of fortuitous, 11% increase, meaning 11% higher than average for those states that have low licensing burdens. This is just another way of depicting the data you saw uh, in the scatter plot. But once we start realizing the demographic makeup of these low income entrepreneurs, you begin to realize there's also an immigration reform component here. So the first, first part of it, we would think maybe there's some mobility issues here. If, if we're worried about income inequality and income and wealth mobility, 
maybe we should be worried about licensing. But if we're worried about integrating people into the workforce coming from other countries, maybe these occupational licensing burdens are also going to have an impact. So if you start digging into this Kaufman data, one thing you start realizing is that the low-income entrepreneurs that we see are largely, and if you look at the bottom right, Hispanic Latinas. Uh, so we're looking at, in fact, if you look at, um, so both Asian and Hispanic Latino, if you look at this total column, that's the total population in the Kaufman survey. It's meant to be, uh, a bit, it's meant to mimic the national averages for the most part. But here we have in the total population, say 4% uh, Asian population, but 11% of, of immigrant entrepreneurs are Asian. In this case, 36% of immigrant entrepreneurs in the sample uh, are Hispanic and Latino, but they only represent 11% in the overall population, both entrepreneur and non-entrepreneur. So we begin to see an outsized uh, proportion of, of low-income entrepreneurs to be immigrant Hispanic and Latinos. So you can dig, uh, dig a little further in this one. You can also segment the, uh, the entrepreneurship rate by native and immigrant, right? And, and that's one thing we know about the Kaufman survey is they've got the demographic data. They've also got country of origin. So we can segment entrepreneurs based on country of origin. So here we go. Here's the entrepreneurship rate for this period here. Uh, immigrants, uh, pretty high compared to natives, uh, much higher actually. Uh, but then you can also start subdividing them. So you get 0.42 for, for immigrants, uh, population, rate, uh, population, sorry, entrepreneurship rate. But then it's 0.24 for the native entrepreneurs. Uh, now, one thing that's interesting about this is that, uh, uh, is that a lot of people will say, okay, well, all these immigrants are just working in construction. That's hardly a, an entrepreneurial endeavor. And what they're trying to get across here is, in my opinion, I think a little crude, but what they're trying to say is, if you're a construction worker, you're probably going to be a, a contractor, and you're probably going to be self-employed in that way, because that's just how the industry works. The construction industry is written in such a way, or created and evolved in such a way that basically you have independent contractors entering onto construction projects. And so they're not really considered opportunity entrepreneurs the way I talked about, people who are trying to start the next Google or, or, uh, or just even start a modest barber shop. But you can take those people out of the observation pool and you can redo the, the math. And sure enough, immigrant entrepreneurs are still a higher rate than natives even after you take out construction from the mix. 0.31% uh, for immigrant uh, entrepreneurship rate versus 0.19. So both of them go down, incidentally, and the natives also go down when you take out construction, but the, uh, uh, the immigrants still stay higher in terms of the, the overall rate. Just want to blow through a couple of these real quick. Uh, entrepreneurship rate by race and ethnicity, you're at 0.27% for, for Asian. And by the way, incidentally, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the licensing burdens that we're seeing uh, again, related to uh, country of origin, uh, and, and, I, and I apologize if it sounds like a stereotype, but it just in the data, you tend to see Asian entrepreneurs will often be in, in a couple of different types of industries. Some of them are tech industries, and those are not licensed. You don't need a license to be a software engineer or, or a developer. Uh, so certain immigrant groups get hit harder than others, and I would argue Hispanic and Latino groups get hit hard, hardest uh, of all the immigrant groups studied uh, when it comes to licensing burdens. So here's the entrepreneurship rate uh, for African American observations. Then we have, uh, so basically white Caucasian, 0.49. But here we are, the entrepreneur rate, so again, 0.52%. This is pretty shocking. The, the highest entrepreneurship rate, on average, uh, among uh, all the uh, ethnic groups is Hispanic and Latino. But there is variation between state. These are just averages. We see this variation between state, again, based on licensing burdens. Uh, just one real quick by age, I had this in here just because I thought it was interesting and we can just blow through this. Uh, native and immigrant entrepreneurs, immigrant is in the green. Uh, again, slightly higher for 20 and 29, but once you start getting into middle age, boom, it starts jumping up here, 30 to 39 years of age, uh, over twice as high an immigrant entrepreneurship rate. Uh, both jump up a little bit for 40 to 49. Once you start getting to the end of your working career, it starts collapsing. And then of course they get closer together in the retirement years, but then again, that's not too surprising, you see that trend mostly in that age bracket, regardless of how you slice the data. So, oh, and actually educational attainment is important here. Let me just talk about this briefly. Again, you can break this up. And this, in this case, this is by total and the immigrant entrepreneur. One of the most burdensome parts of occupational licensing is uh, in the education requirements and what governments require 
what degrees they require or what kinds of training uh, required for any specific occupation. So those people who have a high school or less in terms of their education levels are going to have a harder time with a lot of licensing statutes in most states because they already don't, they don't have the degree in some cases that even allow them to get into the door to apply for the license. So we begin to see that those folks are going to be the ones that are going to have the hardest time in the licensing process. So here we are, there's only about 66%, sorry, uh, total white population, 36%, uh, has a high school or less, but once we start getting to the, uh, so here we are with African American, but then you start getting to Asian, 33% high school or less, but look at this. This is the Hispanic Latino. The total Hispanic Latino population, you're at 60% high school or less, but it's 78% for immigrant entrepreneurs. Now, I happen to think this tells an interesting story. This basically says, these folks are coming to the United States, they might be less educated by our standards in terms of their credential and their, their degree, but they are more entrepreneurial. They are trying to start a business because that's you don't need, arguably, you know, a high school diploma to start a start a barbershop or a nail salon. And this is exactly the kinds of things that these entrepreneurs uh, are trying to do. And yet, licensing burdens are going to get in the way as a result of that. So here's the second scatter plot. This one's a little different. So horizontal axis is still the entrepreneurship rate in this case, immigrant entrepreneurship rate. But the vertical axis is a little different. It's a licensing score. So this is a much broader measure than what I had on the first scatter plot for low-income entrepreneurs, because I, I wanted to get a, a, a bigger picture. I drilled down a bit, but also a bigger, broader picture of the licensing burdens. And basically, we turn the licensing burdens from the Institute for Justice Study into what they call T-scores or Z-scores, depending upon uh, which methodology you want to use. Basically, it allows you to go between 0 and 1, give or take. In this case, the higher score is a heavier burden. On this, on this chart, you don't want to be in the bottom left. Right? Because that's going to be low immigrant entrepreneurs. I'm sorry, you don't, you don't want to be in the top left, meaning you don't want to have high burdens and low entrepreneurship rates. You don't want to be in the top left. Instead, you want to be in the bottom right. So it's, it's similar in that respect. You want to have a high entrepreneurship rate and low licensing score because that means you have a lighter burden. Again, it's a little different. You, start, you do see kind of a scatter, but then here's the pattern is, once again, downward slope. Uh, Incidentally, this one and the last one, after you subject it to some statistical testing, to include control variables, to try to see if there's a way you can explain the variation between states in ways other than the licensing burdens, you start to discover, even after you adjust for the health of the economy, uh, the demographic makeup of the working population, the average education level of the workers in the population, you begin to see that one of the statistically significant and robust explanations for the differences between states is licensing burdens. And oftentimes, it's like the second or first highest or strongest explanation for the differences in the entrepreneurship rate, specifically uh, in the immigrant population pool. So there's one thing that's striking about all of these populations is that they tend to be low education. Uh, they tend to be trying to break into the labor market to start something new. And yet, you start to realize that there's actually a component of folks, regardless of whether they're immigrant status or not, who are in the same boat, in a way, they're coming out of prison. And the people coming out of prison want a second chance at life, and they want to get back into the workforce. Now, this is actually a very important public safety issue, because one of the things we have seen in the criminology studies over the past 30 years is that the best way to keep someone out of prison is to get them a good job, to let them uh, get a second chance at life, and to get themselves back up on their feet. And yet, there are some licensing burdens that make that difficult, if not impossible. And one thing that's, that's remarkable about the occupational licensing statutes that we see on the books is you can live in a state that has very low licensing burdens. It's very easy to get into any number of professions if you don't have a criminal record. If you do have a criminal record, and in some states, even just an arrest record for something maybe like a nonviolent misdemeanor or even a conviction for a nonviolent misdemeanor, you still can't even apply for a license. So it doesn't matter what the education requirements are, what the fee levels are, sometimes you're not even allowed to, uh, to apply for these licenses. And so you begin to see how this might actually have a negative feedback loop. If you can't get a job and you can't do so within three years, which incidentally is the time period that most criminologists notice, the recidivism rate, meaning the reoffense rate, is most likely to occur in those first three years. There are some legislative statutes and some licensing statutes in the book that actually take you three years or more to get a license. And so you're already outside of that critical window to keep someone out of prison. So I think that there is a good argument to be made, and I'll finish on these set of slides here. Uh, and this dovetails with the paper that I'm working with Dr. Schneider on uh, here in Arkansas uh, on how licensing burdens impact uh, 
the, what they call the recidivism rate. In this case, specifically the three-year recidivism rate, that critical period, that period of time when someone is most likely to go back to prison if they don't already have gainful employment. So I've talked a little bit about this. We can speculate and hypothesize why licensing laws might impact those leaving prison. So we already know those with low education levels tend to be hurt the most by occupational licensing. We've talked about that already. Uh, there are populations coming out of prison that they, again, have very low levels of, of, uh, of education, much like the other subpopulations we talked about. These are folks coming out with less than a high school diploma. Most of them don't have a GED even, uh, so they have low skill level. They also generally tend to have low work experience levels, probably for a lot of reasons, but being in prison is certainly one of those. But they have low education levels generally as a result of being in prison. We also know that occupational licensing hinders the ability of ex-prisoners to integrate into the labor force, arguably, or at least that's the, I should say that's the hypothesis. Uh, and I make reference here to these good moral character provisions. Remember I just said that there are some states that require, sorry, that don't allow you to even apply for a license if you have a criminal record. That's what they call good moral character provisions. Uh, and the implication here is that, well, gee, you wouldn't want an ex-con working in your home, building out a, building out a bedroom or, or, or an ex-con driving your, your, you, 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 you to work if your car is broken. These are things that people seem apparently, at least when these laws were put into place, were meant to try to protect the public. And so we've got these licensing laws that on the books, if you look at the licensing burdens, it might look like certain states are very generous, that they don't uh, uh, require a lot in the way of people getting a license, and yet they have the strongest good moral character provisions. That's one of the interesting uh, aspects of this data is a lot of states that look on paper like they're very liberalized in terms of licensing laws actually have some of the strictest good moral character provisions. And so if you're coming out of prison, it's not the same for you. It's different. It means you're going to be hit by a different set of, of punitive burdens than someone who doesn't have a criminal record. And as I've said before, we already know that there's an inability to re-enter the labor force can actually increase uh, the chance of re-offense, or as they say in the literature, recidivism. Let me go ahead and give you, this is, I'm going to do the scatter plot second for what it's worth. This is just the the average percent change in the three-year new crime recidivism rate. I use new crime, and this is just get technical for a second. New crime, meaning these are new crimes different than the ones people were in prison for and being released after they've served their time for. These are brand new crimes. This is not parole violation. This is not failure to meet with a parole officer or, or failure to pass a drug test. Some states will throw you back into prison for that, uh, but not all. And so what you want to do is you want to try to get those those observations out of the mix, because that could really skew things, right? If you have a, if you have a state that's really enforcing parole violations or, or, or probation status, but not doing so much to kind of throw other people back into jail, they're gonna have a different, different recidivism rate. So we look at new crime, because the, the, the analytical definition of new crime is pretty consistent between states, and so we can see variation between states, and then you can group states based on their burdens, but I went one step further. I didn't just take the overall burdens, I also included good licensing provisions. And so I'm gonna look at, show you two bar graphs here. Uh, one of them will be the, uh, the low burden states and the other will be the high burden states. When I say low burden states, I mean those states that have low burdens on licensing, low barriers to entry, and no good moral character provisions. The high burden states will have high barriers to entry for everyone and the strictest good moral character provisions. So even if you did have a rec or didn't have a record, you still have trouble getting into an industry. And here's what we have with the averages. This is the 2.6% is the overall growth of the recidivism rate during the 10 year period studied here from 1997 to 2007. These are the low burden states. We actually see a decline. Now this is odd, I mean not odd, I mean it's not too surprising, but it, it's not what you would expect. Low burden states, those without good moral character provisions and without strict barriers to entry, tend to actually see a decline over this time in the three-year new crime recidivism rate. This tells me anyway, and, I, and it, was, it was shown, and we'll do some more statistical testing on this with the paper I'm doing for Acre, uh, is that you begin to see that the, 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 the absence of these licensing burdens might actually have a feedback mechanism in terms of the ability to get folks coming out of prison back into or into the labor force sometimes for the first time. But here's the most remarkable part. The highest burden states saw a 9.2% increase. Bear in mind, it was a 2.3% average increase during this period for the nation as a whole. And this is, what, four times, over four times that. Here's the scatter plot I talked about. Similar concept, three-year new crime recidivism rate. Licensing score, just like that last licensing score, right? In this case, you want to you have a, a negative 
or in this case, you want to be in the bottom left in this case, right? Low burdens as well as declines in your recidivism rate. And so there's, there's, there's some grouping over to the right, but if you look at the overall, here's where you're at. You actually see an increase in licensing, I'm sorry, an increase in the recidivism rate when you go in higher licensing scores, meaning more burdensome uh, regulations, including good moral character provisions, lead to, on average, higher rates uh, of recidivism in that state. So this leads me to think about some topics for future research. Anyone who wants to go to grad school, feel free to talk with me about maybe whether you want to do something like this, because I think it's an interesting set of questions. The first, all, the first of is um, how do other competing means of trying to get folks coming out of prison into the labor force, how well are they at actually achieving their goals? You might have heard recently about something called ban the box. I don't know, who here has heard of ban the box idea as a general concept? It's, it's gaining a little bit of traction. The idea is it says, it's a, it's a law that says, and usually there's city ordinances, but sometimes there's some state laws as well, and they're starting to grow in popularity, to say private employers cannot ask at the front end of the interview process for a job whether someone has a criminal background or, or an arrest record, or something like that. And the, way they, the reason they call it ban the box is usually on the applications there's a box that you have to check off if the answer is yes. Yes, I have a criminal record. Now, doesn't mean that, they, that the, the company can't follow up later on, even if they make it through the process, they still can do background checks. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about at the front end. But in economics, there's something that we talk about when it comes to uh, information that someone else has that you don't have. It's called asymmetric information, meaning the information is not equal between the two parties. If you're an employer, you only know about the, um, the, the applicant what he or she tells you. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. But of course, if you're going to hire someone, you want to believe it and you want to make sure that it's true. So if you are forbidden by law to, uh, to ask questions that might serve in your mind as a proxy, whether it's correct or not, but it serves in your mind as a proxy for reliability, uh, the ability to do a job well. And again, as I said, these are empirically provable or disprovable claims, but the way that process works is you ban the box, you take away that ability for an employer to get that information at the front end. You might actually have some unintended consequences. And some of the empirical literature on this has actually shown that in places where the ban the box provisions uh, are the strongest and, and are most heavily enforced, or just even in existence, you start to see employers not call back certain applicants because maybe their name sounds ethnic, or there's other sorts of non-quantified uh, non uh, sorts of uh, biases in the process. And so my concern is that if you have a, a process where you can't get that signal, where you're trying to, to, to get some kind of information about an applicant, but you can't do it at the front end with, with a band of box, and again, I'm not saying those are good policies, but you might start going to the licensing board saying, hey, listen, I can't ask this stuff on the application. Instead, I want you, government licensing board, to keep or increase your good moral character provisions so I know if someone has a license, they got through the process because they don't have a criminal record. So in fact, if anything, I think it, these ban the box provisions, if written incorrectly, could actually be counterproductive. It could put more pressure on the licensing boards politically to keep folks uh, coming out of prison from even applying for a license, you might see more proliferation of good moral character provisions instead of less. So the interaction between these things, I think are gonna be important. But then finally, I think the most important topic for future research that we can think about as policy scholars, uh, regardless of the subpopulation we're looking at, is are there alternatives to government licensing? I happen to think there are, and this would be a whole other talk, but the fact that we have a system now that the permission slip to get, a, to, to, to get entry into an industry uh, is currently basically run by people who already have those licenses and they have an incentive to veto new entrants. Alternatives to government licensing probably could be a good thing. Uh, there's actually a number of uh, professions in which there are no licenses in most states. Interior designer is a good example. My brother's actually an interior designer, so I've seen some of the stuff firsthand. And there are national certification tests and, and classes and things sort of you can go through to signal quality. You can signal this without government telling you, but it, it, it enhances your reputation as a designer. It enhances your reputation in the marketplace. It has nothing to do with a government license. It's a certification process. And so perhaps there can be a competing certification process for, uh, for new entrants to a field. It's no longer the, the, the purview of government to say, you're going to stay out of the field. Instead, it's, it's the compelling 
uh, public interest that comes with allowing non-governmental entities to uh, kind of give the good housekeeping seal approval to those people coming into the field. That actually creates a whole new set of incentives that we can talk about later if you'd like. Uh, but for the most part, alternatives to government licensing is, I think, a new, a new field that I think people are starting to explore. And I think that's largely because there has finally been, after decades uh, of, of work on this issue, a broad consensus, both left and right, that occupational licensing doesn't do the things we wanted it to do. And if anything, it actually hurts income mobility, it increases economic inequality, it reduces mobility uh, between states, it does all the things we don't want it to do, and policies that were designed to do that would be considered and deemed awful, and yet these still persist. And so I think the consensus is giving me some hope and some optimism that these types of things, I think over time, uh, can actually be reformed and changed. And so there we go, with that I'm, oh wait, sorry, I got one more here. I didn't even realize that. Oh, wait. oh I just realized that was, uh, never mind. Uh, we're going on to questions, I think, right? There we are. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have some time for some questions. Thank you very much. Is there any way to get the, uh, out of the Latino and Hispanic low entrepreneur income segment, is there any way to take out uh, the uh, multi-level marketing uh, entrepreneurs from that segment? Statistically, Hispanic yeah. Latinos are targeted for those types of, not exactly scams. Right. Uh, it's so bad that even John did a little highlight on it. So sure. So the way the way the data work are, they have the NIAX codes, and they have different industry codes depending upon which data set you're looking at. So. The trick would be trying to isolate that specific code and then segment them out. Problem is, I get the sense it's probably collapsed into a much broader industry code. So you'd probably be also taking out of the, out of the, out of the mix observations that didn't fall into that kind of industry. I Meaning you'd have some, but not all. And so, that, so I'm not sure how you would do it, uh, sort of, in, sort of th there's a way to do it, but it, it might be a crude, a crude proxy, if that makes sense. But I, I understand what you're saying. I think one thing that we have seen uh, in the data, and I think I, I might have alluded to this, is that the, the, the broad proliferation of licensing requirements uh, tend to be on uh, goods and service providers that are in occupations where a large portion of the entrance in incumbent businesses are what they would call low income, bottom two quintiles. Uh, now, the problem is I don't actually know if, uh, if direct marketing workers are licensed in that way. So you, you could do a broader study and include all all employees, both self-employed and not, and that might actually help you out a little more because those, those categories, because they're broader in terms of the number of observations, you might be able to, to strip down the definition and pick out some without damaging the overall sample. Does that make sense yeah. in that way? So I, I realize that's kind of a non-answer, I, I apologize, but it can be done, but it's, it probably takes a lot more digging than I've seen is, is possible now. But the data get better every year, uh, and I think one of the reasons that there's such a broad consensus about occupational licensing is that we've been able to, to dig down into this stuff in a way we never could before. Uh, we've only now recently begun to get uh, data out of census, Bureau, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and other broad, big picture data sets that allow us to make these distinctions and start looking at differences between states and differences between demographic groups in a way we couldn't do it before. So I, that's why I think it's an exciting time to be in licensing research because there's so much fun stuff and questions to, to ponder and to research. Uh, and we can do that now because we have the data, whereas we didn't have that before. Ryan? You mentioned that early licensing practices may have been more beneficial to consumer safety. And I'm wondering what changed. Is it just that we're licensing more occupations now, or are the specific licenses doing uh, less good? Sure, sure. I'm not as confident. I, I, I know I did say that. I was trying to put forward the best proponent's argument for why licensing laws existed in the first place. Uh, and I think that's probably the only real reason I can imagine that these things ever had. I, I take that back. It's not the only real reason. I, I can think of others. But I think even if you assume the best case, that they were put in place merely for the purposes of protecting public health and safety, we, can have, no, we have no question, really, they have morphed into something completely different. And that's partly due to the way these things are structured and the enforcement mechanisms uh, that come from this. In this case, specifically licensing boards. Most states have uh, licensing boards that, that determine uh, 
A lot of the stuff is legislatively set by statute, but they can determine how strictly they enforce things, uh, whether they'll allow non-licensed contractors to do work in someone's bathroom or not. State of Arizona, and this is also very, very strange to me, around Christmas time every year, they, they do Elf on the Shelf print ads or TV ads. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm a father of three kids. I hate the Elf on the Shelf idea. It's very, very strange to me. It's like this totalitarian elf looking at you, you know, on your dining room table. I hate this. But the, way they, the reason they do this is because it's a popular symbol of you know, people watching you. And the licensing, the contractor licensing board, uh, construction contractor licensing board in, in Arizona says, don't let licensed contractors you know, work on your property and the elf is watching you. And it's this weird, weird totalitarian thing. So that, that's an example of, of enforcement that occurs independent of what the law says. Now, uh, the reason I, I bring that up is there is a, uh, so yeah, it, it varies, by, uh, it varies by, uh, by state. There's also variance in what they call scope of practice. And, and let me, actually, this is actually an important point about the way the world exists now versus the way it existed 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and technology has something to do with this. Uh, first of all, in terms of reputation, we can signal reputation pretty easily. If you're a business owner and you have bad Yelp reviews or bad Google reviews, there may be a limit to how much you can really control that, but it may also indicate something broader and something truthful about the services you're providing. Conversely, if you have really high you know, ranking. So there's ways of signaling reputation. I think Angie's List is another example. Um, so it's hard to falsify these signals in a lot of way. But so technologically, we didn't have that you know, 20, 30 years ago. But what we also didn't have 20, 30 years ago was a process where you had the licensing boards that were basically captured by incumbent license holders, people who already have licenses who want to pull up the ladder so no one else can get in the boat with them. And the reason I say this is because we actually have legal proof of this. Uh, and the recent Supreme Court case from a couple of years ago dealt with the North Carolina uh, Dentistry Board. What happened here was the North Carolina Dentistry Board saw on their books, okay, we are in charge of health and safety of people going to dentists. And so we're regulating dentists for X, Y, and Z reasons, and that's our job. And then teeth whitening stands started opening up in malls. You can go to a kiosk and get your teeth whitened. Well, the dental board said, well, you're dealing with teeth, that's dentistry. So you folks in the mall, which in this case was, was run, I think, by, by a low-income entrepreneur. He might have been an immigrant, but I'm not sure. The point being, the kinds of folks that these burdensome laws really hurt the most, they said, well, we're going to expand our scope, what they call the scope of practice expectations for the, for the board and say, we're going to regulate you like dentists. And therefore, you need a dental degree. You need X thousands of hours of training and apprenticeship, et cetera, just to run a teeth whitening kiosk at the mall. Uh, this was a big problem. Uh, it didn't pass the smell test, as they say, for most people, but it made its way to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission actually pressed charges against the, the board uh, and basically said that there's a different legal definition they were dealing here with, but it was basically said, this is an antitrust violation. They basically said, you are a licensing board run by people in the dental industry, and you're saying someone who is doing a service that you guys make money from, you're trying to keep out competitors. And by saying they're dentists, and there's really no compelling proof they're actually dentists, or they're doing dentistry in the traditional definition. I bring it up because, one, it's an important Supreme Court precedent because it's actually going to, has, has started over the past couple of years, changed how licensing boards do things. And, and, and how new licensing statutes are written. Uh, and it's actually sort of kind of squelched the growth in some of these statute expansions, which I think is a good thing. But it also shows you that even though the law on paper may only say you know, you're licensing and, and regulating dentists, how a board can interpret that differently and start expanding their, their purview over things that clearly shouldn't be within their purview. And so that enforcement question, I think, is a broader one. Uh, and that's where I think we're seeing a lot more of the activity. Even though these laws might have been modest in intent 30 years ago, they've really gotten out of hand. A lot of that's enforcement, but a lot of that's also just the fact that we've got this regulatory capture that people in the industry want to keep out competitors. That will have to end. Thanks. Let's thank our right. speaker. Thank you.